you watch the Olympics, most of the people like to see, everybody wants to see the 100 meter sprint, right? We all I think we all have this kind of fascination with going fast, whether it's in a car or running. So we all want to see who's the fastest man in the world. So what we're going to talk a little bit about is how that happens, how sprinting happens, what happens, what's the science behind it, and in particular, why this guy is the fastest man in the world. So Usain Bolt has done some really amazing things over the past few years. So not only is he a world record holder, but he smashed the world record. So he's beaten it by twice the margin that anyone in history has done. So what makes him, of what we know, the fastest human that's ever run 100 meters? So is it about the genetics that he has? Is it part of his anatomy, the biomechanics that he runs with, or the physics that he runs with? Or has he just worked harder than anybody else in history to do this? And I think at the end we're going to see that all these things, it's going to be a combination of this. So really the essence of this is how do you run fast? And I know you guys would probably tell me a pretty simple answer to that, be if I want to walk faster, I move my legs faster. And so if you and I were to race and I move my legs faster than you, I'm going to win, right? Pretty simple. But actually that really has nothing to do with sprinting. That has nothing to do with running fast. And if you watch the videos that, that Rob showed early and you watch the people sprint, they all move their legs at the same rate of speed. And this has been really pretty well studied. If you look at the picture on the bottom here, this is Beijing, the 2008 uh, uh, final heat, and this is where Usain Bolt broke the world record. And if you look, almost every one of these guys has their foot in the same position. So they're really in the same part of their stride. So what's really been uh, well studied is that whether you're a sprinter or whether you're an athlete or a non-athlete, when you're running at top speed, everybody relatively moves their legs at the same speed. And I see some of you guys looking at me and be like, so you're telling me that if I race Usain Bolt, or one of you guys, because you're probably in better shape than me and a little bit better athlete than me at this point, if I race Usain Bolt, we're going to move our legs at the same distance. There's no way that could happen. But it does. Relatively speaking, everybody moves their legs in the, with the same speed. And so we're going to get into why that is and talk a little bit more um, about that. But being fast or running fast and having a lot of speed really depends on two things. So one, it's the amount of force that you can generate. So it's the amount of force your muscles can generate against the ground. If you think of your legs like a spring, as hard as you can push that against the ground, the further and faster it's going to propel you forward. So force is a really, really big thing. And the second thing is really how quickly you can make that force happen. So when we run, we generate this force against the ground. And so you and I, when we do that, we generate about five or 600 pounds of pressure. Now, somebody like Usain Bolt, an Olympic sprinter, will generate upwards of 1,000 pounds of pressure. And there's a really interesting anatomical reason why. And there's been some good studies done uh, where they MRI sprinters. And so these are people that they sprint. That's their job. That's what they do. They're high-level sprinter. And if you look, they typically have a shorter Achilles tendon, so right here. So that's attached to the calf muscle, and longer bones in the foot. Now, if you think about physics, and I know I said don't fall asleep. I said physics. And I'm only going to talk about it for a second. So bear with me. So if you see the guy up here on the right, if you're going to move a really heavy object, you need two things. You need a fulcrum, which is the little thing in the middle, and you need a lever. And the longer the lever is, the easier it is to move that way. So think about changing a tire in your car. So if you're going to use the jack to jack up the car, if you have a long lever, it's easier to pump the car up. If you're really close to the car and you're trying to jack it up, it's much heavier to do that. So you got to think about the foot that way. So this is your fulcrum down here at the ankle your lever is going to be your Achilles tendon, and the force is going to be the force out in front that you're trying to propel your body forward with. And so if you're paying attention, you'd say, well, that, makes, that didn't make any sense. So you're telling me the guys with a shorter tendon, which would make it harder to propel your body forward, are actually faster. But that's actually the precise reason why they're so fast. They can generate, they're, they're, to overcome that short tendon, their muscle has to generate much, much more force against the ground. So in general, Smaller people tend to generate more force in relation to their body weight. If you think about some of the Olympic gymnasts, they're all pretty small. So you see some four foot tall women and maybe in that low five foot range. But if you see them kind of explode and do a triple backflip, there's tons of force that comes out of that. So think about somebody like Shaquille O'Neal or Yao Ming trying to do a backflip. I mean, it's like you think it's almost impossible to do that. And that's very much the same thing for sprinters. Sprinters have traditionally been very small and very compact, and they have a lot of force. Now this is where the real difference comes with Usain Bolt. He is huge. 
He's big for a sprinter. He's six foot five inches tall. And look, if you look across the picture, he's head and shoulders above the rest of the sprinters, right? He's a big guy. So what he also has, he's not only tall, but he's got a huge stride length when he, when he strides out. And so in 2009 in Berlin, when he broke the world record, he broke his own record then, um, and that's the record that still stands. He did it in 40 strides. And so if you look back in the world record performances kind of throughout time and the elite sprinters, they do it in 43 or 44 strides. So he's really getting there obviously much quicker, but he's doing it taking less steps. And he's massive, you know, and we're gonna go back to physics, hold on. He's massive, so when you get an object in motion that's big, it's hard to slow it down. You think about slowing down a dump truck versus one of these little smart cars you see riding around. It's much harder to slow down that dump truck, and that's why, if you look at the bottom, when he broke the world record in Beijing, he, the last 20 meters he celebrated. He had his hands up, he was looking around, and he still crushed the world record. So, you know, he's, he, really is this kind of uncanny combination of size and speed and acceleration. So what we know, you gotta generate a lot of force to be fast, and then two, you need to do that fairly quickly. And so this is another thing that's been pretty well studied. So the time it takes an Olympic level sprinter to put his foot on the ground and get it off is about .08 seconds. And so for us in general, that takes about .12 seconds. And so they do it about 33% faster. So now I know you guys are saying, okay, well you just went through this whole thing about how you don't have to move your legs faster to be faster. And, that, and that's actually true. So to, the rate at which you move your legs is really when you get your foot off the ground to when the foot comes back on the ground. And that has been well studied and is the same for everyone. Gravity affects everybody the same. If you think about a 100 meter dash, in general, that takes these guys about 10 seconds to go through. But only about four, sec of that, four seconds of that is with the foot on the ground. The majority of the time, you're in the air, uh, in between strides. So everybody's affected by gravity the same way. So that's why the, the rate of moving your legs is, is really the same. What they're able to do is when the foot contacts the ground, they're able to generate that force much, much faster than we're able to do. So really, what limits you is how fast the muscle can contract to generate the force. What's pretty amazing is there's somewhere between 600 and 800 muscles in the body and it depends on how you break them up and how you name them and what you call them. And the interplay of about 90 to 100 of those muscles is really the main force when you, when you sprint or run. And it's, it's pretty amazing what happens. You know, when you go through a stride, you have to bring the leg up, the hip flexor contracts, the hamstring contracts, the quad relaxes, the foot comes down. So now the quad has to work, the hip flexor relaxes, and as you come over, your glutes work, your hamstrings fire, and as you push off, your calf muscle propels you forward. Now, how do you do all that? You get signals from your brain that tells the muscle, okay, I have to work, now you have to work, and you have to relax. And what's amazing is all that happens in less than a tenth of a second. So it's a pretty amazing thing to think about. So in our bodies in general, there's muscle are just groups of fibers. They're all grouped together. And they kind of sit intertwined like this. And what happens is the muscle contracts, they pull together. And some muscles can do that very quickly and some can't. And the ones that can do that quickly are called fast twitch muscle fibers. So they can contract very, very quickly. They don't need a lot of blood. They don't need a lot of oxygen. And then you have slow twitch muscle fibers, which are muscles that contract and they hold. They need blood flow. They need, they need oxygen to work. Um, and you guys have all seen this before. So when you go out and have chicken and somebody says you want light meat or dark meat, that's fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. So the light meat is, it's light because there's not a lot of blood flow in it. There's not a lot of oxygen. It typically comes in the breast and the wing. The dark meat typically comes from the legs and the thighs. It's where they have to have a lot of blood flow, a lot of oxygen to. And it's dark because that blood flow's in there and it has to contract over a long period of time. So I hope I didn't ruin chicken for anybody, but I want to make sure that you know you've seen this before. Um, and so what you see is that genetically, sprinters tend to have a little bit more fast twitch muscle fibers to do this. So with all we know and all we learned, is there a limit to how fast a human can go? And so when Usain Bolt broke the record uh, in Berlin in 2009, he was going about 30 miles an hour, so 28 miles an hour uh, to be more exact. And what we know from studies is that we can actually generate more force than, than you see running. If you actually hop on one leg, that generates more force than running or sprinting. So we're really not limited by the amount of force we can generate because we can actually do more. It's the time that it takes the muscle to contract is really what limits speed. So there have been a couple of scientists out there that have tried to predict and say, if, well, if we look at muscle in general and if 
in, on an, in an ideal world, if the muscle could contract fast enough and produce the maximum amount of force, we would predict that a human may be able to run 35 or 40 miles an hour. Now, they're guessing on this. And then you've got some people in statistics that look at the numbers and say, well, maybe, you know, the world record right now is at 9.58 seconds. And maybe the fastest that we can get that, if we look at all the parameters out there, is 9.44, somewhere in the 9.4 range. If you look over the last 40 years, the world record's been beaten by a margin of about 0.37 seconds. So that's about 0.01 seconds per year. So if you take all that data and you look at it, and if you think they're right, that would mean in the next 20 years we should see the fastest that a human's ever going to run. So we should be at the pinnacle of sprinting at that point. So that's only a guess. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't know what, how fast they're going to run in 2012. Uh, but it's going to be fun to watch, and hopefully you look at it in a little bit different way. Thanks.